Hey guys, Bluff Monkey back again for Sonic Academy. And in today's series of tech tips, I want to have a look at some deeper diving into synthesis. Um, specifically, trying to give you some tips on how to hear what all the different components of a synth are doing. So in some respects, it's taking the knowledge of what everything does into what you do with it, if that makes sense. So let's get straight into oscillators. Okay, so we're going to start with oscillators as they, they tend to be the, the first place you, you always start with synthesis. And in this first video, I just want to take a, a simple look at what you probably find in most subtractive or uh, traditionally analog synths. So we're going to use Anna 2 for the most part. Now, obviously, we've got three oscillators um, available and three sampling oscillators. We're going to have a look at sampling oscillators a little bit later. Um, but fundamentally, if we come into the waveform selector, the waveforms you're going to be using most are saw, sine, square, or triangle. A lot of analog synths don't even have a sine wave, but obviously now, nowadays we do. So square can be kind of um, combined in with pulse. Square and pulse are, are related. <clears throat> but we're going to have a look at some of the characteristics of each one. Now, this is, this is bare basics, bare bones, but we are going to progress through these videos but we need to do these fundamentals first. So we, we kind of need to have a look at why we choose one waveform over the other. And I think to, to describe that, I'm going to bring down a, a spectrum onto this channel so that we can have a look at what the waveforms are actually doing. <clears throat> so if we have a simple saw wave, we kind of know what that sounds like already. It sounds very aggressive, very brash, very fizzy, fuzzy. Um, and the reason for that is that the saw wave, this is our fundamental frequency here. But the saw wave also gives us tons and tons of harmonics, which we can see here. All these peaks here are harmonics that come along with the saw wave. So that gives the, the wave a particular characteristic. Now, if we come to have a look at the sine wave, for the most part, we're just going to get the fundamental. You do have these signals happening down here, which are technically not part of a sine wave, but all synths are going to produce some noise, if you like. Um, and down here, if you look at where they're sitting, minus 150 dB, you're never going to hear it. So if you have a look at that on the spectrum, the, the sine wave is just a fundamental pitch or frequency. That's why it sounds the way it does. And then looking at square wave. So it's kind of similar to the saw wave. We still have the fundamental. So the saw wave and the square wave still have the sine wave to start with which is this fundamental, but the square wave only has odd harmonics. The saw, uh, saw wave has all of them, square wave only has odd harmonics. So it's, it's, it's a kind of hollower, colder sound. Now, the words that you choose to describe the sound are up to you, but to me, the, the, the square wave versus the saw wave So saw wave, you always get that fizz no matter where you play it. The square wave, much hollower, much colder. And this is what you need to try and listen to. So we're going to have a look at this in a little bit more detail as we progress through the, de as we progress through the videos, how these, the waveforms that you choose relate to the sound that you get with everything else going on as well. But for now, we're just trying to tune your ears to the, the waves themselves, the, the, the pure waves themselves. Uh, and then coming down to triangle, we're just going to focus on these four in this first video. Triangle is actually quite similar to a square wave. Um, again, you've got odd harmonics, but they disappear much faster the higher up you go. So if we scroll between...
triangle wave almost sounds like a, a pre-filtered square wave. In, in effect, that's kind of what it is. Um, but triangle waves tend to be used a lot for low end. They work well really low down. So another way to show this is, you know, in terms of sounds you might know, I've actually pulled an instance of Foscion, Foscion, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, to into this project. And wow, that's bright. So famously, the, the original 303, um, you were able to select between a saw wave and a square wave. Okay, so forget everything else that's going on. You've got a sequencer and a 303. You've got the bend, you've got the filter, all these other elements that make up the magic of a 303. Uh, but fundamentally, the sound that you're hearing is going to be uh, defined a lot by the, the waveform that you choose, either a single saw wave or a single square wave. So let's run this and just have a listen. Based on the fact that we already know that a saw wave is quite fizzy, quite aggressive, and a square wave tends to be a little bit colder, hollower even. So let's have a listen. So try and hear that quality of the saw wave. Now we've got the 303 filter, which is very characterful in itself. You probably know that sound. E even if you don't know anything about synthesis, you probably know the sound of a 303. So that is the sound of a 303, isn't it? But now listen, switch this to square wave. Hang on, that's also the sound of a 303. How can that possibly be? Well, it's because you're used to both of them. They sound slightly different. In fact, in some respects, they sound very different. But you've got that quality of a saw wave and the quality of a square wave pushing through all the other components of the 303. And this is what I want you to try and listen to when you're when you're learning sound design and you're trying to figure out how sounds are made. And it's not always possible to pull apart a sound, especially when it's covered in things like distortion or effects. Um, what's happening underneath isn't always apparent, but with a simple 303 sound like this, it probably is. So again, listen to that quality of the square wave. And turn off the distortion now. We come back to Anna and remind ourselves, yeah, let's make put this on a square wave. So let's listen to the 303 square and then play a square wave at the same time. So you can kind of hear the quality of the square wave pushing through on the 303. And let's do the same with a saw. I mean, it's much easier to, to detect that saw quality, isn't it? It's really, it's really aggressive all the time, really fizzy. It's buzzy almost. So it's about exposing your ears to the, the defining qualities of specific oscillators. And as, as I said, in this video, we're going to stick to the basic uh, kind of analog subtractive style oscillators first. In the next video, we're going to look at ve oscillator variations and how different kinds of oscillators and oscillator treatments uh, sound. But in this video, we're going to go over it again. Saw wave, fizzy, aggressive, sine wave, pure, in, the, in terms of fundamental frequency and nothing else. Um, there's a reason why you want to use something like this, which we'll go into later on. Square wave tends to be hollower, colder, if you like. Choose your own words. And then triangle, similar to a square wave, but almost pre-filtered. In this video, we're going to take a look at filters and how different kinds of filters can have different characteristics and sounds. So let's get straight in. Okay, I think we're going to focus predominantly on low-pass filters and compare the differences between low-pass filters. Um, so we're going to focus on, or we're going to take a look at the, the analog modelled filters in ANA2 to start with. So we've got Roland, uh, Moog Low-Pass, Korg, EMS and Oberheim. 
So a lot of the times when you choose these filters and do something like that, they're all going to sound fairly similar. So, okay, so they don't really, let's choose the Korg one. There's a, there's a change in level, a change in volume, but overall they sound fairly similar. Okay, so it's quite often the case that you have to add a bit of resonance to actually start hearing the differences. So, especially in the case of a Moog, a Moog style low pass filter, because if we have a look at Spectrum, for example, let me just expand the Spectrum view. So we expect to see, let's see how am I going to show this over here? So if we look at this high end content, when we use this low pass filter, you can see it's taking out a lot of this high end content. That's, that's, that's to be expected. But one of the characteristics of the Moog uh, or ladder style filter, low pass filter, is that when you add resonance, you actually lose a bit of low end. So let's have a look at this. So if you look at, look at this low end content here, look what happens when I increase the resonance. So you can see that happening. This low end information is, is diminishing. And that's just part and parcel of using the low pass filter. We can actually have a look at that as well. If I, if I swap over to something like Diva, which has a, a Moog style ladder filter as well. Let me just turn these oscillators off. Okay, so if I pull up Spectrum again, Okay, as we increase the resonance, or indeed it's called emphasis, we lose a bit of that low end. Now this isn't the case for all low pass filters, so it's something to bear in mind when you're choosing a filter. So if we switch over to um, <clears throat> an Oberheim modeled low pass filter, for example. Let's go back to Anna. Okay, so there's our spectrum readout. So as we increase the resonance on the Oberheim filter, we don't lose that bottom end. So that's one characteristic. And again, I'd urge you to um, just have a play with filters. Just create a simple preset for yourself. Um, load up di different versions of low pass filters, increase the resonance and just sweep them, apply envelopes to them and LFO to them and see how they sound different. Because uh, especially once resonance has been applied, um, once you start sweeping the filters, then they can really start to sound different. Not all the time, but sometimes, and we'll have a look at that. So going back to Roland, uh, Roland I've always found to be <clears throat> quite a clean filter. Not particularly characterful. So have a listen to the harmonics you can hear as I sweep the filter. Let's go over to the Moog. Fairly similar. Uh, this will sound very different, the Korg, the MS-20 model filter much more driven, much more distorted sound. And that's without adding any drive. Uh, and then we'll come down to the EMS. Very, very different again. And then lastly, the Oberheim, which is also fairly uh, clean sounding, but I would always say with the Oberheim filters, they sound kind of twangy and snappy and rubbery. Again, choose your own words. All right, so once you drive these filters into resonance, then you often get the, the very obvious differences between them. Um, and they're going to react slightly differently to, to, to envelopes and LFOs and that kind of thing as well. So 
it's worth, like I said, it's worth setting up a simple preset, maybe a plucky preset, and then swapping between filter models and trying to get your ears tuned to the differences. Because sometimes you'll hear a sound and think, how do I produce that sound? Uh, you'll get close, but you won't get, you won't nail it because you haven't chosen the right kind of filter maybe. Um, and just quickly again, if we come back over to 303 land, um, something you'll notice if I if I play this sequence again, the filter on the 303 is very, very, um, what's the word? I want to say chirpy. Have a listen to it. Kind of liquid almost. That. Yeah, bubbly, liquid, bubbly. You know that 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 kind of characteristic you hear in a 303 here. So if we turn the envelope mod all the way up, in in other words, the envelope acting on the filter, you hear that filter sweep on each note with the high resonance. That. And obviously you can replicate that with any synth, um, but it's these little nuances of each part of the synth that add up to create the the classic 303 sound or the classic Moog sound or the classic Oberhyper sound, for example. So again, <clears throat> we're, we're talking about trying to tune your ears to all the subtle differences between variations in components of a synth. So really, that's all I want to say on filters. Um, whichever synth you're using, whichever synth, whichever filter model that synth has inside it, um, just experiment with them, push them into resonance, drive them a little bit and see how they sound different. Because the Moog filter in Anna 2 is going to sound slightly different to the Moog filter in Diva, for example. That They're all going to sound slightly different, but with similar characteristics. Um, and on that note, I think we've been talking about envelopes. In the next video, we'll, we'll have a look at envelopes and how they can apply to the sounds as well. So I'll see you guys there. Thanks everyone for watching. We really appreciate all the support from you guys. If you love this video, then smash a like. And if you want to be notified about new videos, hit the subscribe and notification buttons.